Yes, uh, Julia, and uh, I'm working as a Web UI a software engineer, and today we're going to cover the topic of uh, web application performance optimization in general, plus React. So our today's agenda is a Rail model, Web Vitals performance metrics, measuring Rail user and dev tools, CRP uh, critical rendering paths, critical CSS, PRPL pattern, lazy loading of style JS, uh, media optimization, network optimization, SSR for devices with poor performance, caching on the front end, React performance analyzing, and uh, don'ts in React. Uh, so uh, let's start with uh, this word slow. So uh, when we speak about uh, the bad performance of our websites, most of us usually uh, use this uh, word slowness. So definition of slowness depends on context and product needs. For example, some apps require uh, their websites uh, to be fast and some uh, businesses just don't. Uh, but in general, when we speak about slow, <clears throat> a slow websites, uh, it means that um, the reaction to user's action takes uh, more than uh, 100 milliseconds. Uh, some uh, do, doing the task uh, more than one second, for example, uh, page loading or filtering. And uh, the frame update uh, happens at more than uh, 16 milliseconds. Uh, so as it means that uh, our, uh, for example, scrolling should happen and, uh, at uh, 15, uh, 60 frames per second. Uh, so uh, there are many characteristics of uh, website performance, but uh, you should always uh, choose uh, the right criteria for optimizing your websites so you can uh, know where you should start. And uh, usually we uh, always think about user and rail model is ideal for that because uh, it's a model where the user experience is in the center. So uh, rail stands for response animation idle and load. As you can see on the page, uh, the first letter is a response. Uh, it means that uh, there, is, there should be a quick response to a button click, for example, so the user doesn't feel any delay. We should uh, draw the result uh, of his click uh, very quickly. User must not feel the need to click again. Uh, so uh, we should finish the task in 50 milliseconds in order to show response in 100 milliseconds. Uh, if more than uh, 100 milliseconds is needed, we should show some loader or just show, show the response to a user action. Show. So you can see on the screen that we are idling the task. Uh, it takes up to 50 uh, milliseconds and we are uh, handling, uh, for example, some input uh, action or uh, click the button and we should show some response uh, and uh, paint it in 100 milliseconds uh, in total. Uh, the next uh, is animation. So it's obvious, it's loading, state changes, dragging, scrolling, visual animations, and they should happen at a 60 FPS speed. Uh, the next uh, is idle. Idle uh, stands for a process initialization, search, sorting, uh, data sending. Uh, we should group the tasks uh, when it comes to optimizing uh, our idling events, and uh, they should be grouped into blocks that uh, react in 100 uh, milliseconds. Uh, it, it may not be the final result, but uh, it's just a response to user's action and it should take place uh, in 100 milliseconds. And uh, the last uh, item in rail model is load. Uh, it means that we should show the first screen in uh, one second. Let's move on. Uh, so the next uh, topic is that we're gonna cover is uh, Web Vitals performance metrics. Uh, Web Vitals, uh, in general, is a Google initiative to provide unified uh, quality guidance to deliver a great user experience. Uh, the Google uh, Google created performance measuring tools to cover the metrics that matter the most. Uh, those metrics are called core Web Vitals. They consist of uh, LCP, FAD, and CLS. So let's start from the first one, uh, largest contentful paint. Uh, it measures a load in performance. To provide a, a good user experience, LCP must occur within uh, 2.5 uh, seconds of when the page first starts loading. Uh, the next uh, is a first input delay. Uh, it measures interactivity. Uh, and uh, it's the time from when the user first interacts with the page to the time uh, when the browser is actually able to begin processing event handlers in response to that interaction. And uh, it should happen within uh, 100 milliseconds or less. 
And the last one is uh, cumulative layout shift. It measures visual stability. Uh, to provide a good user experience, uh, it should maintain uh, of uh, 0.1 or less. Uh, for example, if um, a website a visitor loaded a page and uh, while they were reading it, uh, the banner loads and the page, the page starts uh, jumping, uh, that would uh, result in large CLS scores. So uh, for those metrics, uh, the less, the better. Um, the Chrome uh, uh, the, the Chrome user experience report. Uh, it's also uh, has abbreviation of CRUX or CRUX. Uh, it's a data set that reflects uh, how a real user experience popular uh, destinations on the web. So um, in general, it's just a data set of those metrics and you can track it with different tools uh, that uh, Google created. Uh, it's a part of uh, Web Vitals program and uh, represents uh, the metrics. Uh, so uh, the best tools for, the, for uh, measuring Crux is Page Speed Insights, Page Speed, uh, Speed Insights API, or Crux API. In general, uh, the Page Speed uh, Insights API returns slower than the Crux API because Crux API is native API, but uh, Page Speed includes additional da data provided by Lighthouse. Uh, also, you can see the, the table how those uh, core web vitals are covered by. Uh, different tools. Uh, let's move on. Uh, so usually when measuring uh, rail and in general, uh, the performance metrics, uh, we use dev tools. Uh, so uh, to measure uh, some rail characteristics, uh, we use the performance step where we should uh, uh, just make a recording of uh, the events of, of on our website. So you can click record in the performance tab uh, throttle CPU, throttle the network, record the performance to view main thread activity, uh, analyze frames per second. Uh, you can also monitor CPU usage, just heap sites, DOM nodes, layouts per second, visualize network requests, view different interactions, find scroll performance issues, view paint events. Uh, also, uh, I attached the link for uh, the detail, uh, detailed DevTools guide explanation and how you can uh, play with uh, this performance step. Uh, also, when talking about measuring with DevTools, uh, we cannot skip this root activities. Uh, those are activities that uh, cause the browser to do some work. And to measure them, we use uh, call tree tab, a bottom-up tab, and event log, as you can see on the screen. Uh, in the call tree tab, uh, it's used to view which root activities uh, cause the most work. Uh, the call tree only uh, displays activities during the selected portion of the recording. Uh, you can use also the bottom-up tab to view uh, which activities directly took up the most time in aggregate and use the event log uh, to view activities in the order in which they occurred during the recording. Uh, so let's move on to the critical rendering pass uh, when talking about uh, optimization. Uh, in general, we cannot skip this topic. Uh, critical rendering pass uh, is uh, steps that the browser goes through to convert HTML, CSS, and JavaScript into pixels uh, on the screen. Uh, optimizing critical rendering pass improves render times and reduces the time to interact with the application. So let's go through the uh, key steps in uh, critical rendering pass of CRP. Uh, so at first, we construct the DOM and CSS OM. Uh, building the document object model DOM and a CSS object model tree from HTML and CSS files. Then we generate uh, the render tree, uh, combining the DOM and CSS OM into the render tree, only including the vis visible parts. Uh, and then we go through the layout uh, process, calculating the exact position and size of each object on the screen. And the final uh, step is paint. It's filling out the pixels uh, into each object. This pro process happens in the layers and uh, multiple rounds of paint painting can be required. Optimizations of critical rendering paths involve, but we will talk about it later, uh, deeper, uh, minimizing bytes and reducing critical resources, optimizing rendering or order, uh, pri prioritizing download of critical resources and deferring non-critical ones. So if to look uh, in detail on this critical rendering path structure, uh, you can see that uh, it consists of DOM tree, CSOM CSO tree, and then they combine and build uh, the render tree. So uh, 
in order to start for each element, starting from HTML, uh, the nodes are being created. Each node ha has its attributes. Uh, the DOM has non-blocking behavior and can be loaded by parts. Render tree can be built by having partial DOM. Uh, CSS OM is a node tree with the associated styles. CSS, uh, CSS OM blocks render tree and it can be built uh, without first processing the CSS. A CSS OM uh, has a cascade structure and nesting really matters. A CSS blocks render tree only when it's applied to current page and JavaScript also waits until CSS OM is built. Uh, JavaScript uh, also blocks uh, the HTML parsing. Parser runs script tags at first if they aren't asynchronous. Uh, render tree is a combination of DOM and CSS OM and includes only what's visible on the page. So also it excludes uh, some elements that uh, are uh, displaying none. Uh, layout uh, defines the viewport visible parts and uh, viewport size is defined in head meta tag. And painting is the last process, as I've already mentioned. Uh, the time of it depends on uh, DOM size and its styles. Uh, you can see through the whole critical rendering pass in the performance tab, actually in the dev tools, you, you should go to event log that I mentioned earlier and see the steps. Uh, so uh, at, at first you will see that there is send request to get the index HTML, then parse HTML, uh, then set, uh, send uh, get to get the style CSS and main JS. Parse the style sheet, evaluate script, layout, and final is paint. So let's move on uh, to the next topic. It's uh, critical CSS. Uh, critical CSS is a minimum set of blocking CSS to style above the fold content needed to render the visible uh, portion of the web page, as you can see on uh, the screen. Uh, so um, we, we can identify the unused CSS in the coverage tab. So you can see on uh, the screen where you can find it and you can identify the unused resources and uh, usage visualization of uh, CSS. Uh, also, you can identify uh, the critical CSS with uh, critical CSS generators. It's tools like Purify.js on CSS and critical as it can be used. Uh, so how actually to use uh, this uh, critical CSS when you extracted it, you should inline the uh, critical CSS uh, for above the full content and inline it uh, in the head of the HTML document and uh, defer the rest. So load non-critical CSS after the page load or use preload or fetch it uh, early without blocking the page rendering. Uh, so uh, when talking about uh, the effective optimization, uh, we can use uh, the Lighthouse, and Lighthouse also uh, mainly represents the PRPL pattern. It's a pattern for effective optimization. Uh, Lighthouse is uh, one of the main tools to analyze based on this uh, pattern. So let's review it. Uh, the first uh, letter from this acronym is uh, preload. Uh, so it means preloading of late discovered resources, as those may be hard discovered resources uh, by the browser preload scanner, for example, some background images. And you can see on this example how you can preload the resources. The second one is uh, render. Uh, we should render the initial route as soon as possible, inline the critical CSS and JS, and uh, add a sync attribute for other resources. Or another way to improve uh, first pane is to server site render the HTML file. Uh, the third uh, part from this pattern is pre-cache. Uh, it means pre-caching the remaining assets. A server should load as many assets as possible before the session begins. Service worker can fetch assets directly from the cache rather than, uh, than the server on repeated visits. And the uh, last part is lazy load. Uh, lazy load other resources and non-critical assets, delaying load uh, of resources until they are actually needed, split the entire bundle and lazy load chunks on demand, preload the chunks that are more important, defer images that are below default. So you can see that uh, Lighthouse usually uh, gives us a very useful uh, warning that you ca we can use uh, to optimize um, our websites by based on this PRPL pattern. Let's move on and uh, review in details the lazy loading and, uh, of styles and JS. So lazy loading in general means identifying resources as uh, non-blocking, non-critical, and load uh, those only when needed. Uh, this will help to shorten the length of critical rendering uh, paths and reduce a loading time. 
uh, time. Uh, so uh, let's start uh, with a JS. Uh, we can use a sync and defer. Uh, so if a sync is present, the script is downloaded in parallel to parsing the page and executed as soon as it's available before the parsing completes. Uh, but if defer is present, uh, the script is downloaded in parallel to parsing the page and executed after the page has finished parsing. Uh, if neither async nor uh, defer are present, uh, the script is downloaded at and executed immediately, blocking the parsing until the script is completed. Um, next, we will talk about the CSS. There is no uh, built-in browser feature for laser loading CSS, but you can achieve it using JS. Uh, in the above code, uh, rel preload uh, tells the browser to page the CSS file early, but without blocking the page render uh, on load. Uh, now, and rel style sheet applies styles after CSS file loads. So uh, later, later we'll, we'll also take a look uh, at lazy loading in React. Uh, let's move on to media optimization. Uh, images, videos, and other media files take up a massive uh, amount of data, and they should be uh, really optimized. Um, so uh, first point is um, we will talk about is new formats. Uh, we should use uh, modern formats with superior compression. Um, so uh, on this example, you can see that a useful uh, command line uh, tool is called CVP, a command line tool. And uh, you can see the example of its usage. Uh, so it uh, converts the uh, JPEG image to WebP format. And it's very useful. Uh, also, you can use uh, the uh, library called ImageMin WebP. Uh, you can install it uh, on your application and uh, do this um, transferring into a new format. Uh, so uh, also, you can run um, performance audit uh, in Lighthouse. Uh, go to Lighthouse Options Performance and uh, look for the results of serve images in next-gen's uh, formats audit. Lighthouse will list uh, any images that are not being served in WebP. Uh, the second uh, point is compression. Uh, so uh, you can use uh, ImageMin and plug plugins for compressing different image formats. Uh, browser uh, image compression is um, my favorite one. Uh, it compresses uh, JPEG, PNG, WebP, and other images by reducing resolution or storage size before uploading that uh, the application server has options to support non-blocking compression in web workers. So it will not uh, block your main thread activity. Um, the next uh, uh, item in uh, media optimization is uh, responsive images. So you can use different attributes um, for images. So they uh, take up less space and uh, they are more better optimized. Uh, the first one is um, uh, SRC set, uh, it's an attribute that defines the set of images we will allow the browser to choose between and what size each image weighs uh, is. And uh, the next attribute is sizes. Uh, it defines a set of media conditions, uh, for example, screen width, and indicates what image size uh, to choose. And uh, the last point in media optimization is lazy loading the media. For images below the fold, uh, use a value of lazy. The browser won't load lazy images until the user has scrolled far down enough that the image is about to uh, come into view. Uh, also, you can use a fetch priority attribute to allow important images to be fetched ahead of time. Uh, also, when talking about media optimization, uh, we uh, should mention uh, videos. So uh, similar to images, uh, tools uh, can be used to compress video while preserving quality. So uh, really um, popular one is uh, handbrake. Uh, and another um, option is uh, to use adaptive bitrate uh, streaming. Uh, instead of serving a video with one fixed resolution and bitrate, use adaptive streaming solutions like HLS or DASH uh, streaming uh, protocols. So HLS stands for HTTP live streaming. Uh, the next one dash is used uh, stands for dynamic adaptive streaming over HTTP, and uh, HDS stands for HTTP dynamic streaming. Uh, they help to dynamically adjust quality based on network conditions, and as you can see on the example, on different screen resolutions. Uh, let, uh, let's uh, then talk about uh, network optimization. Uh, there are many uh, overwhelming points that are important for the network optimization. Some of them we will already talk through. 
and uh, but let's talk about optimis uh, optimizing the network uh, waterfall. Uh, so usual uh, waterfall, as you can see, it consists of uh, four steps. Uh, we load the initial document uh, HTML, then we start loading the critical assets, then the browser would know about uh, the dependent assets and load them. And then finally, we start making uh, API calls, uh, which might be required to show meaningful data to the user. Uh, even if reducing uh, the sizes of transferred data, we will still need to wait for all those parallel calls uh, to be completed. So we should focus mostly on reducing the number of steps in that network uh, waterfall. Uh, preloading some of critical uh, resources uh, will help us to reduce the number of steps in network waterfall. So you can see that uh, we started to preload in some critical assets. And uh, now our network waterfall consists uh, of uh, three steps. Uh, so uh, other top techniques uh, for network optimization are eliminating, removing network calls that are not required, lazy loading, non-critical assets, delaying, uh, delaying them, uh, lazy uh, load assets in parallel as much as uh, possible, preloading, prefetching can be used during the initial page load, and reducing resource transfer sites. The, uh, size. That means uh, eliminating unwanted code, code splitting, uh, minification, and gzip compression. Uh, also, when talking about network optimization, we can uh, migrate to HTTP2. HTTP2 uh, has many features um, when uh, that matter uh, for performance. So from those uh, features, uh, there are prioritization, multiplexing, and header compression. So let's talk about the first one. Uh, weighted prioritization allows developers to decide which page resources will load uh, first. Server sends uh, several streams of data to the client at once instead of sending one thing after another. Uh, this method of data delivery is known as multiplexing. Developer can assign each of these data streams a different weighted value, and the value tells the client which data stream to render first. Uh, then let's talk about multiplexing. Uh, the HTTP one loads resources uh, one after the other. So if one resource cannot be loaded, it blocks all the other resources behind it. In contrast, HTTP two is able to use a single TCP connection to send multiple streams of data at once. So no resource block any other resource. And uh, finally, header compression. HTTP two, uh, two uses more advanced compression method for headers. So uh, they just take less space and uh, HTTP 3 is also widely supported nowadays by all modern browsers. And uh, it also adds uh, such main performance optimization features as creating a secure and reliable connection in single handshake, enhanced header compression that supports a quick uh, protocol, and seamless connection migration. Uh, let's move on uh, to uh, API approaches. So when uh, talking about network optimization in general, uh, we can review different uh, API approaches uh, and think about what's uh, better for performance. So here I will review GraphQL and uh, gRPC approaches. First, we'll start, start with GraphQL. Uh, it is an open source query language uh, for API uh, developed uh, by Facebook. Uh, queries are used to request data from the server, and mutations are used to modify the data on the server. Also, you can sub subscribe, and they are used to get live updates when data changes. Uh, the uh, GraphQL allows to uh, fetch and deliver only the requested data, as you can see on the example. With the REST API, we should uh, send requests to uh, this multiple endpoints uh, to fetch different data sets. But with GraphQL, everything relies on your model and how you describe it. So in one request, you can um, pull from different data sets and you can combine and uh, it just uh, it unsuited to your needs. And uh, then let's talk about uh, gRPC. It stands for Remote Procedural Call. Um, and gRPC is high performance open source RPC framework created by Google. Uh, it's high performance binary and strongly typed protocol uh, that uses HTTP2. gRPC creates high speed communication between microservices created by Google in uh, 2015 to speed up the data transmission between microservices and other systems that need to interact. Uh, so, uh, on the example, you can see the mixed infrastructure. So, our uh, microservices 
uh, and internal services um, uh, communicate using gRPC. Uh, to the external uh, APIs, uh, we sent um, some uh, REST um, uh, uh, REST requests, uh, and uh, from the client, we sent uh, GraphQL queries. Let's move on uh, to the next topic. Uh, it's a single site rendering for devices with poor performance. Uh, Server-side rendering generates static content on the server before sending it over to the user's browser. It improves uh, site speed and results in better core uh, web vital score, uh, LCP and CLS that we've talked previously. Uh, Client-side rendering is default rendering method for a single page application. Uh, in uh, CSR apps, the HTML file only contains a blank root, also uh, named app element and a script tag. Since the browser needs to download and run the whole application code before the content appears on the screen, the first page load is usually slow with uh, client-side rendering. Server-side rendering splits the process between client and server. Uh, SSR generates a, a static HTML markup on the server, so the browser gets a fully rendered HTML page. As the browser doesn't have to render the HTML, static content appears on the page faster with server-side rendering. However, the browser still needs to download and process a JavaScript file to add interactivity to HTML elements. As a result, the user will need to wait more before they can interact with the app, and that badly affects the first input delay. So that's to take in mind. Uh, in brief, server-side rendering consists of the following steps. At first, it requests uh, for the HTML document uh, and it's done at first. Uh, then the server fetches any required data from the data database or third-party APIs. The server compiles the JavaScript components into static uh, HTML. Uh, the server sends this HTML document to the client. The client downloads the HTML file and displays the static components on the page. The client downloads the JavaScript files embedded into the HTML processes the code and attach, uh, attaches event listeners to the component. This process is also called hydration or rehydration. Uh, and uh, also, uh, like I've already mentioned, two core web vitals are uh, improved by server-side rendering. It's um, LCP and CLS. Fastest, uh, faster, uh, largest uh, contentful paint, uh, that's the ones that's uh, hardest uh, to pass for both desktop and mobile applications. As, as the largest content element, um, either an image or text block is part of static content your server pre-renders, a server will display it faster on the screen. It's effective for devices with poor performance. And the next um, core web vital that is improved by SSR is lower cumulative layout shift. It measures the amount of unexpected change in the dimension and position of your content elements after the, purge, the first page render. Uh, with uh, server-side rendering, the browser doesn't have to go over the rendering process step by step, which typically results in fewer random layout shifts and therefore better, better CLS score. Okay, let's move on to uh, the next topic. It's the caching on the front end. So except for using uh, CDN services, uh, which are configured to deliver content as quickly, cheaply, reliably, and securely as possible nowadays, we can use some front-end uh, caching approaches that can be a very powerful optimization tool if used correctly. So uh, at first, we will review uh, the caching API data. Uh, so uh, on the example, you can see a very low-level example uh, with the usage uh, uh, of uh, local storage. Uh, so uh, at first, uh, you can save your data in the appropriate storage. You, you should choose one. Uh, use a local data first, then API one, apply cache and validation techniques. So on this uh, example, you can see the uh, local variable uh, version as um, cache invalidation. But as, as I've already mentioned, this is a very low level example just to demonstrate uh, the usage of how, how we can preserve uh, the data that was already fetched, fetched from the API. Uh, so the most uh, modern storages that can be used uh, are uh, local storage, index DB, and session storage. Uh, use local storage as a reliable storage solution for simpler da data uh, needs and uh, index DB for larger, larger data sets. Uh, local storage has storage events, so you can subscribe to it and it can be very useful. And session storage survives only per browser session. 
Uh, then we will talk about the next point in caching on the front end. It's HTTP caching. Uh, it can be controlled by using the HTTP headers. So uh, cache control headers are a set of HTTP cache headers that tell browser how long to cache website content, such as images, videos, or HTML pages. Uh, so uh, the one that is most commonly used is MaxH. Uh, it um, sets um, it saves cache for a specific period of time. Also, you can use public, private, no cache, no store. For example, the no store is to ensure that cache, including the browser cache, proxy cache, CDN cache, store, uh, stores the content on disk. Uh, this header is often used uh, for sensitive information, such as login credentials or payment information that should not be stored on any cache. Uh, and uh, we can also talk about uh, using uh, native uh, JavaScript cache API. Uh, we can handle cache updates uh, in your script, for example, in service uh, worker script. Uh, items in a cache do not get updated unless explicitly requested. They don't expire unless deleted. You can register the service worker and work with the cache from there. Uh, fetch the resources, store and update when needed. And I also attached the uh, guide to service worker lifecycle. Uh, let's move on and uh, also the topics that I wanted to cover uh, in the caching on the front end uh, are uh, the modern solutions for uh, caching uh, in the React applications. So the first one uh, is a 10 stack query. It's a React query in the past. Uh, it supports uh, nowadays React, Solid, View, Svelte, and Angular. It supports different backend API resources like uh, REST and uh, GraphQL. It supports auto caching and refetching, stale while revalidate, a window refocus, polling, real time, parallel plus dependent queries, mutations, a multi layer cache, automatic garbage collection, uh, request suspense, uh, fetch as you render, query prefetching, dedicated dev tools, and other features. So, if to review the process of caching of TanStack, at first it mounts the first query instance, uh, shows the loading state, and make a request to fetch the data, then cache the data. Uh, it mounts then the second query instance and returns the data from cache. And cache timeout is uh, set during ca uh, using cache time to delete and garbage collect the query. It defaults to five minutes. Before the cache timeout has completed, another query instance mounts. It returns the available cached value. Excuse me. Uh, value uh, while the fetch function is being run on the background to populate the query with a fresh value. Uh, also, you can use the invalidate queries method to uh, manually um, handle a query, a triggering query and mutation invalidation. Uh, also, uh, there is a very popular uh, library uh, called uh, Redux uh, Toolkit Query. Uh, it's uh, also amazingly implemented the data caching, uh, and it's similar to Tanstack, but provides more arguments for better controlling caching behavior. So you can use, uh, use uh, those parameters, keep on use data for. Uh, by default, uh, it, the data will remain in cache for uh, 60 seconds. Uh, refetch on mount or argument change, refetch on focus. Uh, it's when uh, window lost the focus or refetch on reconnect, uh, reconnect. It's when user is back online after losing uh, his network con connection. Uh, also, it provides a really uh, nice API for working with the tag and invalidate, invalidating uh, tags. Uh, it triggers the connected queries and mutations with the specifying query arguments by tags. And you can use uh, the example of usage and uh, other uh, examples in the, the attached links. Uh, then uh, we will uh, talk about uh, React performance analyzing. Uh, so. Um, at first, uh, we will talk uh, about lazy loading. React lazy loading helps uh, to reduce the critical rendering path by rendering some components later when needed. Uh, that's useful when component contains lots of heavy scripts or resources that are too big for uh, initial loading. Uh, so um, don't declare inside other components, always declare on top. Uh, use the suspense to have a fallback until the component is uh, loaded. Uh, the next item uh, when talking about React performance is efficiently uh, rendering large lists and tabular data with uh, this library. It's called React Virtualized. It's uh, really 
commonly used uh, tool is technique to dynamically uh, replace rendered items with new ones, keeping the visible portions of the list updated and responsive. It allows to render large lists or tabular data by only rendering the visible portion, recycling components, and optimizing scroll performance. Also, you can use uh, React Lazy Load for lazy loading uh, the images and other resources. You can also use the native uh, Intersection Observer API to detect when an element enters or exits uh, the viewport. Uh, this um, API is also working really efficiently. Also, you should throttle and debound uh, user events. For example, usually we use debounce for uh, searching and for some resizing events, for example, we use uh, throttling uh, to invoke handlers and uh, not over limit resources. Uh, also, uh, you should uh, reduce the markup elements by replacing them with fragments uh, where possible. This will help uh, to optimize render tree. And uh, uh, memoization of functions and values for expensive calculations. Uh, React uh, really provides a great uh, API for that uh, by using uh, useful backend use memo, for example. Uh, also, uh, we can uh, use web workers and move tasks out of the main thread. And uh, this is uh, specifically for long running operations or management of tasks that might uh, block the main thread. And uh, newly implemented and uh, released in React 18's version, use transition hook. Uh, state updates uh, within start transition function are treated as uh, low priority transitions comparing to higher priority state updates. So if a high priority update occurs uh, during a transition, uh, React may pri prioritize finishing the high priority update, interrupting the ongoing transition. This non-blocking transition mechanism is valuable in preventing UI blocking during intensive operations such as data fetching or large scale updates. By deferring the rendering of components, React ensures that the user interface remains responsive, even in scenarios where the UI might, might become unresponsive. So uh, you should definitely uh, try out this use transition hook. And uh, there are also a uh, list of uh, features that you, you, should, you should not uh, use in React and try to avoid. Uh, so the first one is probably a drilling. Uh, so you should avoid going more than uh, two layers deep, so uh, it can cause unnecessary re-rendering. Uh, of course, you should uh, import. Uh, you should not import more than needed. So here I attached uh, the Lodash library example. So for reducing the bundle size, you should uh, only use uh, like the methods that you only need instead of importing uh, the whole. Uh, chunk from the library. And uh, you should uh, otherwise think if you need that library at all, or you, you can use uh, just some vanilla JS. And uh, the next item is not using use memo and use callback for memoizing uh, really heavy operations. Uh, so you should prevent uh, refiltering, recalculating, and reinitialization of values and methods on ev every re-render. Uh, not removing the event listeners or clearing timeouts. Uh, so you need to clear up the memory and uh, not waste uh, resources. Uh, using Redux when local storage context API user reducer can be used. So uh, think twice bef uh, before installing uh, the Redux and uh, choose your uh, state management approach uh, wisely. Uh, the next uh, item is declaring components uh, inside of components. Uh, the code becomes coupled with such approach, uh, non-reusable, and each parent's uh, re-render will recreate the de declaration of the child one. Uh, also, you should not uh, use index as a key. Uh, keys must be unique, uh, unique as React tracks the list items inside the DOM tree for updating them efficiently. And uh, the last items that I wanted to talk about is premature optimizations. So when using uh, use memo, use callback in children components, uh, but the whole tree is being re-rendered by some uh, parent dependencies. So as you can see on the example, even if you are doing some uh, premature optimizations using use memo and use callback for your children, uh, it, it uh, doesn't always matter because uh, the whole tree is being re-rendered by some uh, parent dependency. Also, there is a different case uh, when uh, you're trying to use use memo and use callback in parent components to memoize the values 
or methods that are being passed as a prop to children. Uh, however, your uh, children uh, components doesn't use React Memo. And it also won't make any sense uh, because it still won't save children from re-rendering. And that's the case I also wanted uh, to show you. So uh, we will ha we'll have uh, the example of the simple uh, component called app. Um, it just has uh, one simple state uh, called counter and uh, handle click, uh, which increments the state. And this handle click has use callback. Uh, that means that this method is memoized and it's being passed as a prop uh, to the uh, both children components. Uh, one uses uh, one is without memo and the second one uses memo and we are using that use callback in order to prevent re-rendering for both components so we'll just review the component at first so you can see that uh, one child is without memo and the second one is with memo it is a uh, handle uses use callback and try when uh, then let's try to click and uh, when clicking on the component uh, without memo you can see that it uh, re-rendered so even if uh, you used uh, use callback for memoizing the handlers that you are passing to the component it will still re-render if uh, the children if the child component doesn't have memo so uh, this premature operation won't help and what won't save our children from re-rendering. However, when um, you wrapped your component with memo, as you can see that there is no console lock. So um, just um, use, uh, use those um, uh, React API uh, wisely. And uh, that was it for me, actually. Thank you for your time and attention. and. Um, Maybe you have some questions.